130 years ago, when Williams admitted, Williams admitted his first black student, Gaius Charles Bowling. This year also marks 130 years after Williams established the Gaius Charles Bowling Dissertation and Post-MFA Fellowship, which has allowed 60 academics to teach at the college and embark on their careers, changing the face of the academy. Today we are here to reflect upon the growing work of class action that their partner institutions to help first generation students succeed and capitalize on the opportunities in college environments. Like many of us first generation students, when guys first arrived at, well, at college, he saw an unprecedented level of pressure in the face of the newfound opportunities and challenges that lay before him. Owning up to this heading as trailblazer, Gaius embarked on a path that generations of students preceding him followed, including our keynote speaker today. A first generation college student herself, Dr. Mary Hinton returns to Williams after two decades to speak to the legacies that all of us face as first generation students lead at our institutions today. Channeling her passion for student retention into a career toward education, Dr. Hinton joins us today as the celebrated president of the College of St. Benedict in St. Joseph, Minnesota. In the same breath, channeling the spirit of this weekend, Dr. Hinton is here to speak to us about the pressure of being first-generation college students and the choices we will choose to make as first-generation students and young adults. As we, reflect, as we reflect upon her words and insight, we should take note of the work we enmeshed ourselves within to transform the face of academy and society beyond the gates and mountains surrounding our institutions. By looking back and within, Dr. Hinton aims to thrust us forward as active agents ready to impact the changing world. Join me today as I welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Tyrone. I appreciate that generous introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be with you today and to have an opportunity to talk with you about an issue that is near and dear to my heart, both professionally and personally. Over the past couple of weeks, as I began to prepare for this address, the pressure became overwhelming. To be back in this space and to reflect on my experience here, to speak publicly in front of faculty members and friends who were absolute giants in my educational experience, and to have Dr. Laurie Hetherington one of three women that I consider a true mentor in my life in the audience all served to increase that pressure. But what was most intimidating was knowing that the students in this room are hoping and expecting to have someone give voice to and articulate for others what their experience is. So while I can work through my own thoughts about being back at Williams in this role, and while some of the faculty members and friends have likely forgotten who I am, and while I think Laurie may forgive me if this doesn't go quite as I had planned, I knew that I couldn't let you, the students in the room, down. Because you see, not so long ago, though admittedly pre-internet, pre-email, and pre-social media, I sat where you sit today. And I wanted someone to come forward and express the amazing mix of emotions, the hope, the fear, the frustration, and the need that I felt. I wanted to know that someone understood those complex emotions that seemed to frame my experience at Williams and that frames your experiences on your campuses as well. And as I reflected on the need to represent you well today, I realize that the pressure I feel now is oddly reminiscent of the pressure that I felt as a student. The same pressure that so many of you may feel and navigate and are vulnerable to each day. I wanted to stand before you today to talk about the pressure and with that the central theme of this talk was born, negotiating the pressure of being a first generation college student. So I'm going to speak with you about pressure from three perspectives today. As I said, I first hope to give voice to the pressure that I know many of you feel each day. Next, I want to talk about the institutional pressures that Williams and St. Ben's and UNH and Hampshire and Connecticut, that all of our institutions should feel. And then I want to end with the collective pressure that we face as we look towards the future. So if you'll allow me, I'll begin with a little bit about my background and the pressure that I have felt for much of my life. 
Perhaps like some of you, my first time away from home was somewhat disorienting. Distance-wise, I had only traveled 50 miles from where I grew up in rural North Carolina, but I found myself as far away as one can imagine. You see, I was fortunate that the family my mother cleaned for agreed to pay for me to go to a private women's boarding high school. They made this very generous gesture when my public school guidance counselor told me that college was beyond my reach because I was a black woman. My mother and this family went to great lengths to get me out of this school that did not support my aspirations nor my potential. And that was a transformative moment in my life. Had that not happened, had that vitriolic and simple-minded and racist woman not uttered those words to me, I don't know whether I would be here today. At the moment she said it, and for many years afterwards, though, it just hurt. So I know that many of you in this room know what it's like when your hopes and your dreams are summarily dismissed. I know that pain and that pressure. But I also know that you can never let that pressure compromise your potential. One of the biggest opportunities of my life was born in that painful, challenging, and pressure-filled moment. So this family enabled me to go to a high school. And at that high school, I found myself one of three or four African-American women at the school. It was challenging. I lived in a quad, and my roommates were fascinated by my hair and made grossly inappropriate comments and asked wildly inappropriate questions of me. But what I had to learn then, and what I've continued to learn, is how to survive in a land where I was not only different, but where different was presumed to be bad. Now, times were very different over 30 years ago when I arrived at St. Mary's, but that was my challenge and my pressure to figure out how to survive in a new world. It was also my opportunity. And as you think about the pressure that you face each day, I want to encourage you to think about the opportunities within those pressures. You see, at that point, a small seed that's only recently been sprouted was planted. I have, for a lot of my life, been different. And it's taken perhaps too long for me to not only be comfortable with that, but to embrace it and to use the pressure of difference to survive. And I encourage you to think about how you can use the pressures in your life to survive. So from St. Mary's, I headed off to Williams. And the challenge of New England liberal arts colleges in the late 80s and early 90s, and Williams was not immune to these challenges, was that they were only beginning to find their way with first-generation college students, low-income students, and students of color. Centuries-old institutions like Williams had not been built for, nor had their success been predicated on people like me. So today we celebrate the long legacy of, of the Bolin program, but the systematic engagement of students of color and first-gen students was still fragile during my time here. Now, I want to be very clear. I am a proud Williams alum. And this place, where we are today, is the reason why I feel so passionately about the liberal arts. In fact, my commitment to the liberal arts, especially for first-generation students, was born and nurtured in this Purple Valley. I know, because of my experience here, that education can allow you to change the course of not only your own life, but the lives of others. And I'm grateful that Williams did that for me. But I felt enormous pressure and significant challenges during my time as a first-gen student here. In fact, there are two components of my experience at Williams that continue to shape me as I think about leading a college today. First, I never quite felt at home at Williams. I loved it. I come back often, but I never felt quite like it was home. You see, I came from a very poor family, and I never had the resources to do what my friends could do. I had to work multiple jobs on campus. 
This weekend, I've been teased by my daughter about how many people I babysat for. Um, it's in the dozens. I've babysat for more college presidents than probably anyone else in the United States. I also worked in the daycare center and the computer center. And I know there are people in this room who are working two and three jobs, whose college experience is really being shaped by their work identity. But because I had to work multiple jobs like many of you, I couldn't really hang out on the weekends. I couldn't afford many experiences that my peers were able to take for granted. I only got to go home for Christmas and summer. And God bless Lori and Keith, who invited me to share all manner of holidays with their family. Senior year, I took a train from Massachusetts to Illinois, and that was the only spring break trip that I took, and that was for a research project. I never had clothes with the Williams logo on them because I couldn't afford them, and I borrowed my textbooks from the now defunct 1914 library. So I think about this experience as the president of the College of St. Benedict because I want every student on my campus on this campus and on all of your campuses to have a collegiate experience wherein they feel at home. It is your right to feel at home on campus. And I believe that this community at Williams wants and has taken great strides towards that. It's my job to make that happen in the community I am so fortunate to serve. But it's what I think every student on a college campus is, in fact, entitled to. But there's an interesting second thing that happened while I was at Williams that haunts or inspires me, depending on my mood. Um, at some point, I also stopped feeling at home at home. I no longer shared interest with some of the people I grew up with. I wanted and I had some access to more. I had a level of privilege that my peers in Kittrell, North Carolina would never have. The pressure to fit in on campus and at home was stifling at times. I often felt like I didn't belong anywhere. And I had to learn, and I'm still learning, and you will have to learn, and it may take you as long as it's taken me, to try to fit in wherever you are, to make wherever you are your home. But I confess that I spent a long time feeling vulnerable to that pressure. And I know that some of you may go home and feel that you don't fit in as well. So I know the pressure and the attendant loneliness that you may feel, the pressure to continuously represent a group or a family or a place, the pressure of your family's hopes for you as you're the first in the family to go to college, the pressure to be an ideal E for whatever your mascot is, the pressure to represent all first gens all the time, the pressures and the expectations of your home community to make something of yourselves, the unrelenting pressure to succeed academically in the midst of all of these challenges. Your success, the pressure of your success is on behalf of more than just you, and that's not fair. And I know a lot of people don't say that, but that pressure is not fair. It's real but it's not fair. So just know that I honor you and I respect you students for bearing up under that daily pressure and know that you will succeed. But there's a second set of pressures that I think it's essential we discuss. And that's the pressure that Williams and St. Ben's and all of the colleges represented here should and I think do feel. While our institutions differ in some key ways, there are two ways in which we are very much the same. All of us are part of institutions that achieve excellent outcomes for their students, and all of us want to and need to and must embrace first-generation and underrepresented students and the pressures we've discussed. An excerpt from the Williams College mission statement, and I encourage you all to read your college's mission statements, but an excerpt from Williams says, 
quote, we ask all our students to understand that an education at Williams should not be regarded as a privilege destined to create further privilege, but as a privilege that creates opportunities to serve society at large and imposes the responsibility to do so, close quote. So there is an important recognition of privilege that's here. And there was a similar recognition during my time as a student. There is privilege for each of us in college. Everyone in this room can think of someone they went to school with who is just as smart, just as talented, who will not have the opportunities that each of us in this room has today. So there is privilege even when we feel that we are excluded and that we do not fit in. It was having a glimpse into this world and recognizing how it could transform not only my life, but the lives of those around me that laid the groundwork for my leadership, that fuels my passion for educational equity. And I hope that you take that sense of privilege and opportunity that you're afforded and think about how you can help change another's trajectory. So even as you balance the very real pressures that you face, I want our institutions to balance and feel pressure as well. I should feel pressure as a college president. So I want to pose some questions for the institutions we are part of. As institutions, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready to provide not just access for students to support their transformation, but are we willing to allow students to transform our institutions? You see, there are students on our campuses who are giving all they can, and yet they feel like it is never enough, that they have to bend to the pressures with no hope of institutional reciprocity. And this is where college access and college success questions get complicated. How do we help those who have historically been excluded have a sense of ownership of their collegiate experience? Or is it so important to us as institutions to maintain who we are that we are willing to compromise the experience and the learning of students by being unwilling to be transformed by them. What pressure and challenges must we experience institutionally in order to maximize the experiences and opportunities of our students? And if we're not wrestling with those questions as institutions, we are failing you. I was reading in the recent Williams alum magazine that a fifth generation Boland descendant, Lauren Hobby, class of 2010, was quoted as saying, quote, I refused to feel like I didn't belong in these spaces, end quote. It is incumbent on us as institutions to provide for every single student on our campus that exact same sense of ownership that sense of belonging. Yet I don't know that we are doing as well as we could. Were I to poll the first gen students here or in Minnesota or in most campuses in the United States, many would say that their college campus is not home, that we are asking them to contort themselves to be who we think they should be or who we want them to be to fit our image or our stereotype of who they should be. We are asking young people to be grateful for the privilege extended to them, but I don't know that we are always appropriately grateful for the privilege they extend to us. You see, students, your presence enlivens our campuses. You bring a diversity of perspective you enable us to incubate new and dynamic ideas. You are the center of our mission, and your presence enables us to live out our missions, which demand that we free the minds of those entrusted to our care. As a result of that freedom, of that liberation, we contribute to the common good, to our democracy, and our world. It is your presence 
and your work over a lifetime that allows us to touch a future far beyond our reach. So we feel institutional pressure, and we should feel institutional pressure. And our pressure is both about what we do in the present and how we leave a legacy for the future. And that takes me to the final pressure I want to talk with you about today, our shared pressure, if you will. And that's the pressure to secure our collective legacy, to contribute to a world that's better than the current one. Right now, at this moment and in this place, you are defined by being the first in your families to go to college. But you know, and I know, that that is not the sum total of who you are. In fact, that may or may not be your primary identity at any given point in time. But today, you're defined as first. I'm defined as first. When you were going to college, there may have been people in your community, in your school, in your church, who celebrated you for being the first to go to college. When I was appointed the president of St. Ben's, the mention in the Minneapolis Star Tribune was about my being the first black president of the College of St. Benedict. But the pressure on you, on our institutions, on me, is to identify the many wonderful intersecting identities that you are comprised of and to embrace each of them. Because while being first is groundbreaking, being last is a legacy. And I want to be last in some ways. I want to be the last college president who sees any achievement gap based on race or income. I want to be the last who has to worry about whether or not low-income students are participating in experiential learning opportunities. I want to be the last who has to assure parents that their children are physically and psychologically safe on campus because young adults are physically and psychologically safe everywhere. I want to be the last who prepares young women to succeed in a world complicated by barriers, biases, and inequities because I want to live in a world where those barriers, biases, and inequities are dissolved. And in some critically important ways, I want you and your institutions to be last, too. I want to trust that you will be the last students who have to stay on campus for spring break because you cannot afford to take advantage of another opportunity. I sincerely hope that you are the last students who have to go home and justify your decision to attend college to your family and your friends that you are the last generation to feel out of place in your community of origin because of your educational attainment. I pray that you are the last generation of students who feel as if you are a visitor in Williamstown or Amherst or New Haven or Waterford or wherever your campus town is, always on guard to prove either that you fit in or to rebel against the same. And may you be the last generation of students who has to explain the value of the liberal arts and education to a world fixated on career preparation. But amid all of the pressures that you face, and whether you are first or last, I want you to take solace in knowing that things do change. You see, I am the daughter of a woman who has never had a birth certificate because when she was born in North Carolina 90 years ago, black births were not systematically recorded as they weren't perceived as having value to the world. I am also the president of the College of St. Benedict, a thriving women's liberal arts college in central Minnesota. And every day, I reconcile and I embrace those extremes of my life. I am proud of where I come from. I am proud of each and every one of you. And I hope that you are proud not only of where you are going, but of where you've come from. You're here because of work that came before you. 
and you and I have work to do for those who will come after us. So the pressure I want us all to feel as we leave here today is the pressure to discover who we are on our own terms. First or last, students, I want you, beneath all of that pressure, to discover and embrace who you are. And I want the colleges who serve you to do the same. As Ralph Ellison wrote, when I discover who I am, I will be free. The pressure I want you to feel, the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity on your horizon is the pressure to define yourself and to find freedom in that self-definition. Thank you very much. If you have a question, stand up, raise your hand. Swen Ho. A short one. Amazing speech. Oh, thank you. So it, it, you the <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. Um, I think they recorded. It will be up on the Williams College YouTube channel in a couple weeks. Oh, wow. YouTube. <laughs> That's cool. Any, sorry, go ahead. You spoke about how you spoke about how you don't want to, uh, as an institution, you shouldn't want to, um, to contort, like have your students contort to like whatever systems are already in place in your, in your institution, like whatever culture is already in place in your institution. But I, don't know, I feel like sometimes it isn't accounted, the fact that students have to contort themselves and like change themselves before they even get to the doorstep of some of these institutions. Like I had to go through this um, program, like that helped me get to place um, among all of you. But the things I had to like the things I had to do, like the amount of code switching I had to do, all this language that I'm using that I don't want to use, but it's the only credible language I can use. So if people listen to me, like that I don't know, it does something to me. So I don't know who I guess I don't know. That's not something taken into account and I'm I'm curious I'm curious to, as to how that can be something that's taken into account or what so the question was, and correct me if I, if I misstate your question, the question was, how am I supposed to survive in this land if I don't contort myself? If I boil your question down, does that summarize it a little bit? What it, and you've talked about code switching. Yeah, that, that gets exhausting, right? I mean, you have to figure out. Who am I going to be in this moment? My fear and the reason why I want to push institutions to not contort our students is I fear there's a part of you that will get lost as we push on you to be someone you're not. I tell, St. Ben's serves women, 1,924 women, and I often tell the students at St. Ben's that who they are is sufficient and good enough, and I needed someone to tell me that, and that's what I'm telling you. Who you are is good enough. You, are go you work hard. I know you work hard because you got there. You overcame whatever challenges there were for you to get there. We all have ways that we talk. So some code switching we all do. The way I talk to um, my spouse is not the same way that I talk to the students in a class that I'm teaching, right? So there's some of that just your, your environment demands you respond. But, but you shouldn't have to change who you fundamentally are as you define yourself for someone else. And I think some of the unrest that we've seen in higher education is because people feel like who you want, I can't be who you want me to be. You can only be you, and that's sufficient. So how do we create environments in higher ed that welcomes and embraces you as you are, helps you become the best version of yourself? Like that's our job, is to help you become the best version of yourself, but ultimately you should get to define who that is. And I think that burden and that pressure is on institutions to do that. I hope that gets to your question at least somewhat. 
Melissa, and again, guys, we don't have a lot of time. And then we have one question in the back. You know, I think what I hear, and, and I don't want anyone to leave and think, well, her college must be immune to it. It's not. I, I just want to be very clear that I don't know of any college that's immune. Because what I'm hearing young people say is, I'm not at home. You've invited me in, but you've set all of the terms. My voice isn't welcome. My perspective isn't respected. So I think what what I find I have to do, what I encourage college presidents to do, is to have those authentic conversations with students, take the feedback, and figure out how do we welcome and respect a young man just as he is on campus while still engaging in transformational educational practices. When I hear what's happening on campus, I, I often doubt it's about that single event that's in the news. It's about a culture of people feeling like an outsider. And you can only bear that pressure for so long. So I think we need more authentic conversations on campus. And I think the most important work we can do is to make our campuses feel like everyone on them has an ownership stake in that campus. Hope that, hope that responds to your question. And I can stay around if people have and there was one more, the young woman in the back, and that will be the last question, but Mary will hang around afterwards for people who want to come up and talk to her. So, hi. Um, I go to the University of Chicago. I was just commenting to my friend here about how I can never see the president of my university doing such a as the one you just gave. Um, so, uh, my question to you is, how do we get our presidents to engage in this sort of conversation to even begin to hear Um, that's a very good question. Um, and, you know, maybe I just did huge career damage. I'm not sure, but um, it's worth it. You know, I think you, I, my, students email me. I mean, that's sort of the hallmark of my presidency is being available to students. So email the president and ask for a conversation. I would start with a request for a conversation. Can we talk about some suggestions? The other thing, and I was talking with Sharifa briefly about this, is I find that I tend to, I share my story, I like to hear other stories, but we collectively have to get from stories plus what are the structural things we can do on our campuses to make a difference? So maybe email your president and say, I'd like to have a conversation with some, I want to share with you my experience and share some suggestions. I would think any college president would welcome that converse. She's shaking her head now. Um, <laughs> I would hope. That any, co that any college president would welcome that conversation. So in keeping with the theme, may you be the last student who is fearful of approaching a college president, because that shouldn't be the case. We are on our campuses to serve you. So you should be able to do that. Thank you very much.